Who is Satoshi Nakamoto? When you ask people this question that have done some research, you get a number of different answers. There's about a handful of people that have all been involved in the cypherpunk movement in the early days that have long been rumored to be Satoshi. There's also the idea that it could be a group of people or perhaps even some sort of agency. In this video, we will be exploring some of the most relevant facts revolving around this mystery, as well as a new crypto revolution happening once again with another development that has the potential to transform global finance. Who is Satoshi Nakamoto? working on the idea of a new digital money that would be entirely private, be not connected with the government, be global, and purely digital. The rabbit hole for this is going to get insane. One possibility is that it's Halfini. The first transaction of Bitcoin was between Satoshi and Halfini. It's very notable that the one project it doesn't refer to is Nick Zabo's Bitcoin, which is perhaps the closest precedent and the closest parallel to Bitcoin. I mean, Bitgold is so close to Bitcoin, it's hard not to think that, you know, maybe Nick is Satoshi. The man in these images is the Bitcoin founder. The man who created Bitcoin is known as the father of Bitcoin, the online currency now worth yeah, billions. Nothing to do with Bitcoin. That's not me. Are you Satoshi? Yes. Okay. That's called Bible and Slander. That's why we're going to have to think before, because they know that you can't there are only two of the accused who are British, and only one of those has two spaces in every one of his papers. Without people, it will take you 15 minutes. Who is Satoshi Nakamoto? Um, I don't, uh, really don't know. I would suspect it's one person, just because of, you know, consistency of code and difficulty of keeping privacy and secrets across a group. People have a background in hierarchical thinking. So some people are wired a little bit different and they don't like authority and they want to think for themselves. But many things about society are hierarchical. And so if you look at what the media tends to do, it's sort of mass market media and the average person, they see something new and they want to like, oh, who's in charge of it? Who should I ask? And presumably he's not coming back at this point, right? Patent number 6829355 is one that you guys might want to look into. On this patent, it's a device for a method of one-way cryptographic hashing of the SHA-256 uh, and the algorithm and who, who owns the patent to that? Glenn M. Lilly of Sykesville, Maryland. Uh, and get this, you want to know who he works for? Uh, National Security Agency. This patent was filed eight years before Bitcoin had its brand name. So my initial theory was that the NSA created this. That's kind of being changed after reading through this whole thing. Paul LaRue has shown us is that if you want to operate as a successful organized crime syndicate in the 21st century, it is no longer enough to have just money power and muscle power. You also need a special set of skills which come in use online. You need to be good at encryption, you need to be able to understand cyberspace jurisdiction and how to exploit those holes in order to make massive profits. He is off the charts. People who've worked with him thought he was a genius. We're going to dive deep into who Satoshi Nakamoto is and I'm not going to lie to you guys, I really think this is legit. It just all makes sense. It all makes sense. Welcome to Clover Crypto. If you're looking to learn more about decentralized applications, trading, and other passive income opportunities, make sure to hit that subscribe button and the bell for notifications so you don't miss out. All right, guys, this is part one of a two-part series where we're going to be diving into some of the most intriguing facts about some of the people that were involved in the early phases of Bitcoin's development, the cypherpunks community, a group of activists that are involved with cryptography, their fingerprints are all over the Bitcoin project. So we're gonna be taking a look at some of the in interesting facts 
that some of those guys have with that history. I polled my community and it was really interesting to see the results. It was pretty even across the board. A lot of different opinions on who might be the most likely person to be Satoshi, whether it is an individual or whether it's a group or a collective of people. So we're gonna look at some of the, the facts that we know and some of the most intriguing information in this video to give ourselves a little bit more of a better framework. One thing we do know about Satoshi is that he did not create Bitcoin from scratch. He combined a number of different ideas that had never been combined before and he gives credit the way dies be money, Hash Cash from Adam Back, along with Nick Zabo's Big Gold. A number of other projects have been documented in the white paper, as well as online postings. The principal innovation that Bitcoin brought was proof of work, which provided a new type of consensus protocol, which was able to prove transactions and gave rise to this type of protocol that we now know as the blockchain. Satoshi took a wide variety of steps to make sure that no paper trail came back to him and the most advanced research suggests he's British based on the use of British English phrases and grammar, including the use of double spacing. Encoded into the Genesis block is the Times article out of London about the bank bailouts, and the time of day analysis on when he posted suggests British Standard Time. It's important to keep this in mind as it's the strongest evidence that we do have, even though it is circumstantial evidence and some of this could have been faked, it is what we have to go by. And so we're going to take a look at all of this interesting information and how it connects. Hal Finney is typically at the top of most people's lists of potential Satoshi candidates as he accepted the first Bitcoin transaction, was very integral in the cypherpunks movement in the early days and was in constant communication with Satoshi helping him with the project and ironically lived two blocks from a man named Dorian Satoshi Nakamoto who is completely outside of the cypherpunks community but could have been an inspiration for the moniker name of Satoshi. Hal was a pre-Bitcoin cryptographic pioneer and the first person other than Nakamoto himself to use the software, file bug reports and make improvements. A writing analysis was conducted to compare Finney's writing to Satoshi, and they initially found it to be the closest resemblance they had yet come across. It was theorized that Finney could have been a ghostwriter, or at the very least, there is a high probability that Hal was more involved than he claimed to be. Though the consulting firm that conducted the analysis concluded after meeting Finney and seeing the emails between him and Nakamoto and his Bitcoin wallet's history, that Finney was telling the truth. Hal was from California and died in 2014, well before his time due to ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. Hal knew he was dying, and he didn't die until two years after Satoshi stopped speaking in public forums. Price had been established at that time, and he would have had the private keys if he was Satoshi. He continued to code and work on Bitcoin wallet security until his death. You would think he would have made some sort of plan to leave the private keys to a trust or to his family, Though he is typically at the top of most people's list due to his involvement with the project, it seems very unlikely given what we now know that he would have carried out this elaborate scheme to hide his identity as Satoshi until his death. Nick Zabo is widely considered the next most likely Satoshi candidate as he created the most similar precursor to Bitcoin called Bitcoin Gold. It's interesting to note the numerous similarities between the two projects and that Nick was conveniently left off the original white paper though cited later as an influence to the project. Zabo is an American of Hungarian descent who has a legal background receiving a law degree from George Washington University. He developed the original phrase and concept of smart contracts with the goal of bringing what he calls the highly evolved practices of contract law and practice to the design of electronic commerce protocols between strangers on the internet. Stylometric analysis was conducted to Zabo's writing style in comparison to Satoshi's and has been shown to be even more similar than Finney's, including the double spacing after sentences. He is shown to have been interested in using pseudonyms in the 90s, and Zabo noticeably went publicly silent from August 2008 until mid-2009 when Satoshi was most active on the origins of the Bitcoin project. In a 2011 article posted by Zabo, he stated about the Bitcoin creator that myself, Wei Dai, and Hal Finney were the only people I know of who liked the idea, or in Dai's case, his related idea, enough to pursue it to any significant extent until Nakamoto. Nick frequently denies being Satoshi, even stating that he's used to getting doxxed by now. 
though his writing style, along with the request asking for help to code up BitGold, which never ended up launching before Bitcoin started, and the similarities between the two projects, his notable absence in the white paper and public posts during the critical time when Bitcoin was being developed, all these circumstantial coincidences, along with his legal background, give strong indications that he could very well be the strongest Satoshi candidate. Another potential Satoshi candidate based on strong circumstantial coincidences is Adam Back, the creator of Hashcash, a big influence on the Bitcoin project, as cited by Satoshi in the white paper and in public postings. An early cypherpunk and the only candidate from Britain with perhaps the closest linguistical connection, including the use of British phrases, spellings, along with double spacing, and he would be a more ideal candidate based on time analysis of the postings and notably was missing during the important periods in Bitcoin's early development. There was a well put together three part documentary on Satoshi by Barely Sociable that draws the conclusion that Adam is the most likely Satoshi candidate. Although not everyone agrees with the conclusion, it does bring up some thought provoking info on one of the earliest cypherpunk pioneers. Now, Craig Wright's claims to be Satoshi are widely regarded as inauthentic. The real Satoshi could easily identify himself, whether it be through a simple digital signature or by making a Bitcoin transaction from one of the many addresses considered to be Satoshi's. There's too much evidence that refutes Wright's claims to cover in this video. However, a recent multi-billion dollar lawsuit in Florida had two intriguing possibilities come to light. First, the lawsuit on behalf of Dave Kleiman's family claims he was involved in the invention of the digital currency and that Wright had defrauded them of the rights to over a million Bitcoins mined in the first four years of Bitcoin's development. So one possibility is that Kleinman is the pseudonymous Satoshi and Wright stole the intellectual property sometime around Kleinman's death in 2013. In this hypothetical scenario, Wright knowing the real Satoshi is deceased and in possession of his encrypted hard drives, Wright would have the confidence to come out and proclaim himself to be Satoshi, knowing that once the hard drive's encryption is cracked, that he would eventually have access to the private keys and thus could proclaim himself to be the real Satoshi. Another very interesting possibility that was leaked in court documents in the climbing case revolved around TrueCrypt and E4M encryption for the masses inventor, Paul LaRue. Wright filed a motion for a protective order in which he states that evidence supporting his claims he is Satoshi includes sensitive information about his ties to criminals and his involvement in their apprehension and incarceration. Therefore, the protective order had been redacted so that criminals included in the document would not learn of Wright's involvement with their arrests and seek repercussions against him. However, whoever was redacting the document failed to black out one of the corresponding footnotes that identifies the criminal kingpin in question, Paul LaRue. So there's a strong assumption that LaRue is the unnamed individual Wright is afraid of repercussions from in the protective order, and it's suggested that with LaRue's extraordinary encryption and programming background, that he may have been involved with the development of Bitcoin, if not the creator himself. Apart from LaRue's criminal background, he is known to be a brilliant programmer who, like Satoshi, was intimately familiar with C++ as well as being obsessed with privacy and cryptography. LaRue started working on E4M encryption for the massive software project in 1997 with the goal of mass adoption. It's capable of encrypting entire disks with an option for plausible deniability or denying the existence of an encrypted volume. The ideals of the project are strikingly similar to those of Bitcoin, and using this technology he developed, he was able to build an international enterprise with complete privacy and security. LaRue published a manifesto of sorts stating that governments are increasingly relying on electronic data gathering, citing projects such as Echelon linked to the five nation states which would become known as the Five Eyes more than a decade later. He stated that encryption is the only way to preserve civil liberties, and he goes on to explain, strong encryption is the mechanism with which to combat these intrusions, preserve your rights, and guarantee your freedoms into the information age and beyond. LaRue was intimately involved with the project TrueCrypt, and it is believed Satoshi used this software that rides on top of E4M coding to store his 1 million Bitcoin securely onto hard drives, which Craig Wright may be in possession of now. Around 2011, LaRue changed from software development to move to other things, 
as his prescription pharmaceutical business distribution was restricted by the DEA, and this coincides with the time period that Satoshi disappeared from public forums as well, citing that he was moving on to other things. Now, Wright doesn't have the best reputation in the crypto space, and few believe a word he says. Therefore, everything he claims must be rigorously fact-checked and treated with caution. That being said, how does the Craig Wright, Dave Kleiman case, and Paul LaRue all fit into this perplexing, bizarre, yet entirely possible theory? One possibility is Wright is an employee of LaRue and also an informant who helped to bring him down in 2012. Wright and his longtime friend and business partner Dave Kleiman managed to get their hands on LaRue's encrypted hard drives that hold the 1 million bitcoins, but all of the contents on the hard drives are locked away in secure true crypt volumes. It's been noted that Wright has set up warehouses of computers dedicated to try and crack the encrypted hard drive's code, disguising them as crypto mining farms with his close friend Calvin Ayer. According to Wright, it may be possible to crack the code within five to 10 years. It's been theorized that Wright has spent years trying to crack these hard drives, but with no success, which is why he has yet to offer valid proof that he is the real Satoshi. Now, this is a lot to take in with many unanswered questions, so most would be highly doubtful with this series of events, which is understandable. Yet there remains a lot of parallels between Paul LaRue and Satoshi. They had very similar beliefs, skills, and ideals. LaRue had an extensive history of using fake names and multiple passports. On a legitimate diplomatic Congolese passport, he goes by the alias Salachi, very similar to Satoshi. Both had programming expertise, particularly with C++, an obsession with cryptography and privacy. Satoshi's disappearance lining up with LaRue's new endeavors. Both were highly wary of authority as expressed in LaRue's E4M manifesto and Satoshi in the Bitcoin white paper. Both had an interest in online gambling, LaRue well known by friends to have gambled online, and Bitcoin's initial code had a poker client included. Both understood a new digital payment system was needed to improve on the difficulties of traditional payment systems. LaRue dealt with clunky online payments in his online prescription drug market, and Satoshi expressed understanding of payments in the Bitcoin white paper. Both used similar spelling and language such as analyze, color, bloody hard, and defense. LaRue was a multi-millionaire, if not a billionaire, and as such would not have needed to cash out his Bitcoin once the price began rising. LaRue is suspected to have run a team of anonymous developers called the True Crypt Team. All in all, if anyone could have hidden wallets containing 1 million Bitcoin, it would have been the creator of disk encryption software TrueCrypt. Also curious to note that in 2002, seven years before Bitcoin is released, somebody posted something that sounds an awful lot like an early idea of Bitcoin. It's long been suspected that Satoshi himself wrote this post before actually creating Bitcoin seven years later. Even more interesting, the IP address of the author has supposedly been traced to the Netherlands a country where LaRue is known to have lived around that time. Despite all the surface evidence that suggests LaRue could be Satoshi Nakamoto, there are still reasons to believe this is not the case. For example, in 2009 when Satoshi was refining Bitcoin, LaRue was already establishing himself as a cartel boss and is known to have been involved with drug smuggling and gun running operatives. How would Satoshi be able to do all of this while also starting a forum and answering noobs questions about Bitcoin? Therefore, one could argue that Wright's claim to an association with LaRue are completely fabricated in an effort to show he was connected with the origins of Bitcoin. So it still remains a mystery, though the suspicion is compelling because some of LaRue's former colleagues believed he had worked on it, but couldn't find any corroborating evidence. That is a brief overview of the top five Satoshi candidates. You have three cypherpunks in Hal Finney, Nick Szabo, and Adam Back. You also have two guys involved in the Kleiman lawsuit that have a more plausible connection than the widely discredited Craig Wright. There's a few other cypherpunks that have been mentioned as well. You have Wei Dai, you have Tim May and David Chom that were very integral in the early phases of the cypherpunk movement. And you also have the possibility it could be an anonymous group, perhaps some sort of government agency. All of Satoshi's writings, both publicly and in private emails, accounted for a total of 80,000 words, and they can be viewed online at the Nakamoto Studies Institute website, which I've linked below. What we have just covered is the most relevant evidence to date on the most likely Satoshi candidates. In part two of this series, we're gonna go deeper into Satoshi's writings and how those correlate to what we now know about this revolution in finance. Bitcoin was a complete paradigm shift for many people and it's just getting started. It is the internet of money and currency is just the first application. What we're seeing now is there are infinite possibilities with decentralization and second generation projects and blockchains. People are building things that are innovative, new, and just brilliant. Things we've never seen before in banking. 
things that wouldn't get past the first planning meeting at your average bank because they would just get completely shot down. So when you have these two financial environments running side by side, the banking system where everything requires permission and it is most certainly not granted, versus a completely open system where all of this innovation happens on the edge without permission, guess who wins? Guess where all the exciting things happen? Now, Bitcoin is the most expensive cryptocurrency. It has the most money behind it. It is the one that everyone knows because it was first, but it does have a lot of limitations behind it. It can be slow, sometimes taking hours to process transactions. Those transactions can cost several dollars, if not more. So you're dealing with something that you need like a third party application in order to interact, to process something as simple as buying a cup of coffee. So you're seeing that void being filled by these next generation blockchains. And first it was Ethereum in 2015. It was a little bit faster. It was a little bit cheaper. And now you're seeing these next generation blockchains, EOS, Tron, and the one that I am most bullish on, iOS T, where transactions are nearly instant and they're free. You have a lot of scalability with these next generation blockchains and the things that you can build on top of it are incredible. PowerMind is one of those opportunities as it's one of the most innovative projects on the iOS T blockchain. It's one that Satoshi would be very proud of as it fits in with a lot of his ideals of the digital financial revolution, which first started with Bitcoin. With PowerMind, you buy one token and you earn daily passive income from all of the different decentralized applications and crypto projects that the group is invested in. It's a collective community of experts with a wide range of experience that pools resources to find the best projects and opportunities for the group to get involved with. Nowadays, crypto trends change daily, so you wanna make sure that you're in the know. So check out PowerMind.club. It's one of the most steadily increasing passive income streams in crypto. And now it's your turn. What are your guys' thoughts? Who do you think Satoshi is? Let me know what you guys think in the comment section below. We're gonna be diving more into this in part two of this video series. So be looking out for that next video. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to smash up the likes and subscribe. And thank you guys for watching.